Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Daryl Williams, Senior Vice President for Science and Education at the Franklin Institute. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this special program featuring Margaret Marnon, who, along with Henry Captain, is the recipient of the 2021 Benjamin Franklin Medal in Physics. Since 1824, the Institute has honored more than 2,000 scientists, engineers, inventors, and entrepreneurs for the most groundbreaking achievements of the past two centuries. Our laureates have truly changed the world, and Dr. Manan and Dr. Captain are no exceptions. They hold a special place in the legacy of the Franklin Institute Awards as a married couple receiving an award together. Though rare, they are not the first. In fact, Marie and Pierre Curie received the Institute's Franklin Medal in 1909, so you can see they are in good company. We are just a few days out from the Franklin Institute Awards virtual ceremony, where we will honor them and nine other individuals for their remarkable work in science, engineering, and industry. We hope you will join us this Thursday, April 29th at 7 p.m. And we want to acknowledge the wonderful support of the presenting sponsor of the awards ceremony, Bank of America. Visit our website at fiu, I'm sorry, fi.edu slash awards to learn how you can join the celebration. Before we begin, I would like to thank the University of Pennsylvania and especially Professor Andrew Liu, Hep Hepburn Professor of Physics at Penn for her efforts organizing today's program. We owe Dr. Renan's presence today to Dr. Liu. She is our Physics Medalist Laureate Sponsor, member of the Franklin Institute's Committee on Science of the Arts, who along with other members of the Physics Subcommittee led the investigation of Dr. Renan and Dr. Captain's work, a process that often takes years. Dr. Liu, thank you for your dedication and thank you all for joining us today. I will now turn it over to Dr. Liu. Hey, thank you, Daryl. Well, I must say it was very inspiring to me to, um, to sponsor this case. Um, so, um, so yes, it's uh, my, Honored to um, introduce um, Margaret Mernon today. Um, so let me first say what the citation is for um, for the for the for the Franklin um, Medal. So it's uh, for their pioneering innovations that have made high-intensity sources of X-rays practical and widely available for the study of a broad range of physical processes including chemical reactions at the quadrillionth of a second time scale. It really is a very exciting thing that they have done. Um, they, they have um, been uh, really the leaders in, in uh, pushing this technology um, that you're going to, and the science, that really deep science underlying it uh, that made it possible um, uh, that uh, Margaret is going to talk about today. So um, one thing that Daryl did not mention that in addition to being a husband and a wife team, both of them are the first in their family to go to college. That's one of the very inspiring things about them. Um, so, um, and their career paths since they met in graduate school are identical. So I, I, I'm really talking about both of them as I, as, I, as I talk about Margaret's career path. So she, earned her uh, PhD in physics at Berkeley. Um, uh, and uh, then joined uh, Washington uh, State um, in Pullman uh, as an assistant professor, where she's promoted to tenure, uh, then moved to the University of Michigan um, in 1996. And in 1999, moved to um, the University of Colorado Boulder, where she is now. Um, the honors um, that she has amassed um, along the way are, are really way too many to name. So I'm just going to say a few of them. Um, so um, let's see, where to start? Well, uh, she was a MacArthur Fellow. Uh, uh, she's uh, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, um, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, 
uh, has won the Ahmed Zawail Award from the American, and you'll see the, the, the range of these different societies. The Ahmed Zawail Award of the American Chemical Society, um, um, the Ar Arthur Shallow Prize in Laser Science um, from the American Physical Society, the R.W. Wood Prize of the Optical Society of America, um, and the Boyle Medal of the Royal Dublin Society, which is the highest award to an Irish scientist. Um, and, uh, oh, and the Willis Lamb Award for Laser Science and Quantum Optics, which is also an APS prize, I believe. Is that right? Or is that not? Yeah, I think that is an APS prize. So, um, but uh, I'm going to, I think, stop there and let Margaret take the floor so it's not to take too much time for her talk. But thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you, Andrea and Daryl. Um, I'm so honored to be here and I appreciate so much uh, this opportunity to present a public lecture where I'll try and explain um, what are the exciting opportunities and challenges in building the microscopes of tomorrow. And this uh, research uh, involves a very large team of people. And I think it's the aspect of science these days that I enjoy most about. Um, as Andrea said, um, I met my husband in graduate school and I've had the fortune to be able to do science with other people ever since then. And it is so much more fun to work with other people and discover new things. Uh, so uh, just in terms of excitement and the tools we have available, um, the 21st century is absolutely the best time to be a scientist. And I always say that to the students I work with, um, if you just look at computing power or the microscopes or the telescopes or the communication uh, capabilities, via the World Wide Web. Um, you know, when I was a graduate student, uh, the World Wide Web, Web was not available for the you know, general communication. We had no microscopes that where we could see, literally see the positions of atoms and uh, the Hubble wasn't even uh, launched. So uh, it is absolutely incredible um, what science has done for us. And if you look at, for example, just what you're carrying around in your, uh, you know, your pockets right now, um, the first commercial hard disk drive needed, <laughs> you know, to to go into the cargo hold of an airplane, whereas we can now buy a flash drive with an enormous amount of memory for, you know, just slightly more than ten dollars. So this is quite amazing and exciting, but it's actually very fortunate. Um, that we have these capabilities. Uh, and that's because you know, there are some hard challenges facing us as a you know, global um, society um, in you know, access to clean water, uh, the need to shift to clean energy. Um, we all understand the need for better medicines um, after the past year. And you know, the tools for discovery as well as making these technologies and better medicines uh, possible are really critical. And among those tools, you know, microscopes are quite important in almost every branch of science and technology, whether we're talking about you know, faster cell phones, better thermoelectrics uh, to recover energy from heat, or better microscopes so that we can look at uh, viruses and vaccines. And if we look at what are the spatial scales that we need to be able to look at to, for example, image uh, the next generation ele electronics or look at molecules or the surfaces or components of viruses and vaccines, we need to be able to look at things all the way from the atomic scale on up. So from a fraction um, of an angstrom or 10 to the minus 10 meters um, on up to centimeters. And we can do that using a variety of different types of microscopes. Uh, what I've shown here, but not to the same scale is uh, a light-based microscope that one might have you know, used in your 
um, in your science lab at school or a, an electron microscope, which looks like a, a bigger version of the light microscope. And actually they both work in somewhat similar ways. You shine light or electrons on a material, focus them on a sample, focus them with a lens, and then use another lens to make an image and then uh, can see, see how, depending on how good the lenses one use are, one can really uh, focus down to um, micron scale or 10 to the minus six meters or nanometer scale, um, which is 10 to the minus nine meters. And you know, to get to this place uh, that we have these amazing tools at our disposal, you know, it took well over a hundred years. Um, the electron was discovered in 1897 uh, and, and scientists, including De Broglie, um, began to understand what exactly the electron was because sometimes electrons behave like particles and sometimes like waves. And uh, eventually by 1933, Ruska built the first electron microscope that could take an image with a resolution better than that of a light microscope. But you can see his first electron microscope looked a very primitive compared to the modern day electron microscopes that we saw um, on, the, on the previous slide. But it is so fortunate that we have these amazing tools. Um, in 2017, um, uh, uh, three scientists were awarded uh, a Nobel Prize in Chemistry for an advance related to electron microscopy. And this, was, this is called cryo-electron microscopy that works for biological samples, where the samples are frozen and then put into the electron microscope so that the delicate samples don't fall apart when one bombards them with electrons. And I'm sure nobody at, or very few people at the time thought how quickly these would play a very vital role for our society because they were used to image the COVID-19 uh, virus and take a picture um, of the, oh, excuse me, um, um, of the, uh, uh, the, the proteins on the uh, outside of the virus, the spike proteins um, on the outside of the virus. Uh, back just last year in 2020 and helped confirm some structural models of the virus. And of course, once one understands the structure, uh, then one can try to um, des design a vaccine. And one of my colleagues, um, Hang Zhao at UCLA, um, he had been pushing the capability of this cryo electron microscopy for quite a while um, and really uh, being able to handle a huge amount of data so he could push the resolution below what is normally possible to below two angstroms in res resolution. And uh, he achieves that by averaging over 200 images of a vaccine and then using algorithms to help recover an image. And so Hong, last summer when most of us were not allowed uh, into the universities, um, uh, because of uh, the, uh, the, the COVID uh, outbreak, um, uh, Hong's group uh, was working at UCLA throughout the pandemic to um, help Moderna make an image of their vaccine. Um, and that capability was after years of learning how to push electron microscopy and cryo-electron microscopy really to its limits. And I'm going to show you a movie that his group made on this uh, published on, in cover of Nature uh, last year on the action of molecular syringe and why it is very interesting. To fight infection, doctors often prescribe broad spectrum antibiotics, drugs that each kill a number of different microbes. These drugs have a downside though. Some bugs develop resistance that they can pass on to other bugs, making them even more dangerous. The drugs also can wipe out helpful microbes in the human gut. If antibiotics targeted specific species of microbes, they wouldn't have these disadvantages. Thanks to a collaboration led by faculty of the California Nanosystems Institute at UCLA, we're one step closer to that kind of advance in precision medicine. The researchers examined a naturally occurring nanomachine that kills bacteria, an R-type of hyacinth. 
It's made and released by a bacterium called Pseudomonas aeruginosa to sabotage its microbial competition. The scientists revealed the piacin's atomic structure and described its mechanical action using leading edge technology from the UCLA Electron Imaging Center for Nanomachines at CNSI. The study portrays an elegantly simple and specific killing machine. Some details revealed in earlier research from the study's leaders. The piacin has a cylindrical trunk. An outer sheath surrounds an inner tube, the piacin's weapon. Below the trunk is a base plate with six tendrils. The piacin lands on a bacterial cell. The tendrils act as sensors. The new study provided previously unknown information about what happens next. When the tendrils bind to specific structures on the cell's surface, the base plate splays out. This triggers the outer sheath to collapse, driving the inner tube down into the cell, killing it. This research feeds into bio-inspired engineering, technology that takes its design cues from nature. Understanding how the piacin recognizes its prey and deals its killing blow could enable scientists to better mimic and even customize its action with the potential for antibiotics that are more specific, harder for microbes to gain resistance to, and gentler on patients' bodies. So uh, that was a really amazing uh, animation. And I wish we had um, uh, microscopes that could really make that uh, nanoscale movie. But most of what you saw was an animation based on a series of static images that are shown here. And so this is one of the things we want to uh, uh, achieved by building a next generation microscope that can actually make that um, uh, molecular scale movie. Now, X-rays also have an equally long and impactful history um, uh, just around the time um, of the discovery of the electron. Um, in 1895, Bronkin dis discovered X-rays. Um, and then uh, soon thereafter, Bragg discovered X-ray crystallography and Kirkpatrick Baez made the first X-ray microscope um, uh, depicted here. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I'm just picking a few highlights here, but certainly one of the highlights of, of science in the 20th century was to use X-rays, uh, look at their scattered light pattern, and from that figure out that DNA was actually a double helix structure. And, and uh, that was discovery was made by Rosalind Franklin, Franklin and her co-workers. Now I have a, a selected um, a highlight here in 1952 that a lensless imaging was proposed theoretically. And let me uh, explain uh, why that was important. So uh, this is important because if you think about where we use x-ray imaging, whether it's um, airport security or mammography or medical CT. And if you look at the images that one is seeing, um, they're not very crisp. Now, this is despite the fact that the x-ray wavelengths that are being used are way down in a fraction, a tenth of an angstrom or a hundredth of an angstrom or even a thousandth of an angstrom. And, um, Part of this is that essentially we're making images uh, with an X-ray light bulb, and that's not the only issue. Um, uh, both high energy X-rays and electrons can damage particularly delicate samples, and we have no perfect X-ray lenses. It's uh, X-rays tend to go straight through objects. Um, this is why the radiologist always moves away from you when you're getting a, an X-ray, and so. Uh, it would be great to be able to go beyond those uh, limitations. So uh, the current microscopy landscape is that, you know, the capabilities are truly amazing. And so there've been many, many Nobel Prizes awarded for this area. And even with those gorgeous movies and gorgeous discoveries, um, no, no imaging technique, nanoscale imaging, whether based on electrons or X-rays or visible light, none of them are anywhere near their physical limits. 
They're, none of them are yet perfect and all of them are way too slow. So for example, when um, Hang Zhao worked with Moderna, it took about three months to get the first image of the virus. And so it would be just superb if we could accelerate that. And some of the challenges we have to um, tackle are manipulating large amounts of data, um, developing new algorithms that are smarter at extracting image, images from scattered light or scattered electrons. And in many cases, those challenges are being addressed by separate scientific communities, that one community would be making visible microscopes, another community making electron microscopes, another community make, making X-ray microscopes. And on top of all of those limits, as I said before, most microscopes take a static image. But if we look at timescales in nature, um, you know, from the seconds corresponding to protein folding to uh, nanoseconds corresponding to uh, molecules rotating uh, to picoseconds for um, vibrations to, to uh, femtoseconds where electrons can move around in materials. Um, if we could have a microscope where, in, where instead of getting a static image of a sample, we could actually see a circuit or a virus penetrating a cell, if we could see those in action, it would really help with our uh, understanding. But the, this is very hard to do because what we have to do for that is we not only have to build a microscope that can see a sharper static image than we've ever done before. On top of that, then we have to be able to uh, take many, many copies as the system, as the virus penetrates the cell or as um, heat or electrons flow in a new quantum device. Um, and so we need to combine the hardware with a computational or software and um, computing toolbox. And that is very difficult to do um, and requires not only better computers, but better algorithms and better ways of moving data around. And, uh, you know, I, many areas of science are running into these uh, roadblocks. Um, uh, and as uh, Laura Waller, my colleague at Berkeley, who, who developed this slide, um, commented, you know, the only way to deal with, with to deal with big data is to take less of it. But we have to have smarter, smarter algorithms that can give us a beautiful image without needing so much data. And this is just very different from uh, the type of science that, uh, which is, or, or the idea um, that one person can figure out a problem. And in fact, it was the story of Archimedes and the Golden Crown where uh, Archimedes figured out that he could tell if the crown was made of gold or, or um, as a, uh, an alloyed metal by figuring out how much water the crown displaced. Um, the true gold crown would displace less water than a mixture of gold and silver. And um, as a kid, I read about uh, the story of Archimedes and the idea that he would get excited by figuring out a puzzle was very attractive to me and really what made me very interested in science. Um, but here, you know, Archimedes figured out the problem by himself. And in the 21st century, that's really not how we do science, uh, you know, to combine different types of microscopes and figure out the data science and the computer science and the applications. We really need very large teams. Um, and that's different from, uh, uh, Andrea met, mentioned, uh, Henry and I we met in graduate school, and we did our PhDs in parallel in labs beside each other. And that's very different from how we work now, where we have just very large teams beyond our own groups, but um, through our uh, science and technology center um, that is building that microscopes of tomorrow through these many institutions, uh, CU Boulder, Berkeley, UCLA, uh, UC Irvine, uh, Fort Lewis College, uh, Norfolk State University, and Florida International University. And so this is the strobe team here. And uh, 
This is a picture of our graduate students um, at a graduation ceremony looking exceptionally happy. Um, we try to make a science fun, but they always look extremely happy when they uh, graduate. And uh, 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 Mark Siemens, one of the students uh, shown in this picture, uh, uh, made the comment that he thought his daughter um, was the person who paid the most attention to his thesis. You can see some light coming in and scattering off an object, and you can see uh, this uh, budding little scientist uh, really uh, studying that very carefully. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that seeing is understanding. Um, if we can really see processes in action uh, in real time, we can understand them better. And uh, to do that, uh, we need to have microscopes that can both see very small ob um, objects and also act as strobe lights to capture very fast processes. And uh, uh, I'm uh, for the next uh, section of my talk, I need to move to another file um, because uh, Okay, yeah, not quite yet, okay. And so question is, how do we make a very fast uh, strobe light? Um, so at the first uh, experiment uh, in which people tried to capture very fast events um, was the beautiful photography um, of Moybridge, where um, at the time uh, Leland Stanford was the governor of California and he had made a bet that at some point during the gait of a galloping horse, uh, all four feet left the ground, but nobody could prove that. So Moybridge set up a series of cameras and trip shutters based on uh, just uh, uh, ropes. And sure enough was able to capture uh, a freeze frame, the gait of the galloping horse. And then moving on, you know, almost a, sen a century later or so, um, light flashes can be much shorter than the millisecond times of mechanical shutter. And so with a strobosp stroboscopic photography, Edgerton was able to freeze frame a bullet penetrating an apple or this beautiful image of a water droplet. And that's because uh, this strobe light based um, on uh, stroboscopic photography could capture could, could uh, have a, a flash of light um, a microsecond in duration. But if we want to go further and really see atoms vibrating or freeze frame some of the movies that I showed earlier, then we have to go even faster. And it turns out that uh, to do that, the best way to do that is to use um, light, in particular, light waves whose phases or crests are synchronized. And this is what lasers do exquisitely. Um, all of the waves can be synchronized exactly. And if you add a number of waves with different wavelengths, which is the same thing as saying different colors, if you add them constructively, then where they all interfere, you get a very short pulse. And where they, where they interfere constructively and where they interfere destructively, you get nothing. And suddenly you have the most exquisite strobe light that we have made using any technology. And in fact, we now have the ability using lasers and we, a laser that one could uh, uh, accessible even to um, uh, high school students that we can make a 10 femtosecond light pulse uh, with only a few cycles of light in duration, um, about one fiftieth of a human hair. So this light pulse looks like a pancake propagating around the table. And it is almost unimaginably, unimaginably fast. In fact, um, it turns out that one minute is the geometric mean between this 10 femtosecond light pulse and the age of the universe. So it is so fast that it can pretty much capture any process happening in our natural world. And now I, I want to move to a slightly different slide deck because um, it turns out that uh, with all the movies, I can't put 
all of the talk in one, um, one slide deck, but while I'm changing, um, wanted to ask if there, anybody has a question while we're changing over. So, so far, I think there, there are questions, but I, but they can wait until the end. So. Okay, okay, Andre, so I'll, yeah. I'll move on, so. But I did have a question that the, the sure. work, the work uh, on imaging the vaccine. Yes. That was used using your x-ray microscope? No, that no, was that using was, cryo that was microscopy. Using cryo, yes. No. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Yep. Okay. So uh, what, um, you know, what do these fast laser pulses allow us to do? So they allow us or are allowing us to move beyond our uh, the current widespread spread use uses of X-rays, which are mainly based on that same X-ray tube technology that Röntgen used when he made that first image of his wife's hand and and the ring on her finger. And I mentioned before, um, you know, X-rays were used. Uh, you know, from um, an X-ray tube were, were used to uncover the double helix structure. Of DNA and and used in, in your doctor's and dentist's office and in security, but the images are blurred because essentially what we're still using is basically an X-ray light bulb. We're um, boiling electrons off a of filament, accelerating them to very high energies so they emit very high energy X-rays, but the light is spreading out just like the light from a light bulb spreads out. Uh, so you might say, well, so why not? Um, one could, if the light was directed, we could make a much better X-ray source and a better X-ray microscope. But there's a problem in that to make uh, a, an X-ray laser, the power required is extremely high. And in fact, if we put in some numbers, we can, if, if I were uh, giving this talk in person, I'd be holding a green laser pointer and that's powered off a pair of batteries. Um, because it doesn't take uh, very much power to make a laser that gives a directed beam of green light. But if I want a laser that gives a directed beam of one nanometer light or one angstrom light, I would need a terawatt or a petawatt of power. Now, a terawatt is the equivalent to approximately the electrical generating capacity of the entire United States. So making x-ray lasers that lays all the time at these very short wavelengths is just not possible. And there are some beautiful um, new developments in using electron accelerators to make x-ray lasers. Um, it's gorgeous technology, um, but it is quite expensive and large. This is a two kilometer long electron accelerator that was used to make a free electron laser. Um, this is the scientific name for it, but this X-ray laser that lays at 1.5 nanometers, it costs about $2 billion. So as a technology that would allow widespread access to new types of X-ray microscopy and imaging, it is just not scalable. It is absolutely fantastic though for science. And so that's why uh, we're pursuing another direction, which is to take lasers where we can make them in tabletop scale lasers and uh, shift them to shorter wavelengths. Because in terms of the laser technology itself, as I uh, explained, uh, the power requirements to make, to push lasers to very short wavelengths is just not, it's just prohibitive. And as a result, we've been stuck at 200 nanometers, which is just a quarter of the wavelength of the first laser. We've been stuck there for over 30 years. But there's a new technology that we can use called high harmonics that allows us to take visible lasers and make them uh, and shift them to shorter wavelengths. And a nice way to think about the, the technique we're using is an analogy to sound. So if you have a violin or a guitar and you pluck the string gently, uh, you'll hear the fundamental tone. 
And then if you pluck very sharply, you should hear harmonics of the fundamental tone. And then if you pluck really hard, uh, the string will break. And it turns out that a femtosecond laser can pluck the quantum electron wave function in an atom so hard it breaks the atoms apart, but it takes the atom a while to fall apart. And while it's falling apart, one can get up to 5,000 harmonics of light of the fundamental driving laser. And so that allows us to take a laser, which we call uh, a quantum conductor, and uh, make the same number of atoms as there are people on Earth uh, sing in tune at the same time. And then we get these beautiful beams that span from the ultraviolet through the soft X-ray region to about a couple of kV and hopefully much higher soon. And so essentially what that allows us to do is move away from the type of microscopes I've been talking about where we can't make perfect optics and we get blurred images you know, for um, our uh, uh, CAT scans and other, and instead shine the laser beam on an object, you get this beautiful diffracted light. And the diffracted light looks nothing like the object that you uh, shine the beam on, but a computer algorithm can take that pattern and convert it into an image. And uh, it does that, um, by um, a phase retrieval. So let me show you a little beautiful applet that was developed by uh, uh, Kathy Perkins um, and her team. And I've got to share this. Uh, yeah. So it will just take me a moment to pull this up. Good, okay, that's it. And this is called uh, wave interference. And uh, what you see here is a laser shining on an object. And they can, uh, Kathy uh, and Ariel have arranged it so we can pick different objects. We can pick circles um, or squares or circles and squares or arrays of circles or the stick girl is what they call this one. And in each one, so this is the new, this is a representation of what we do in these new types of microscopes. We can shine um, laser like um, x ray beams on the sample and then look at the light that's scattered off the sample. And if we just look at the, uh, uh, the, the hole in the uh, uh, circular hole in the sample and look at the scattered light, then if we change the size of the hole, you can see that the scattered light changes. If we change its orientation, the pattern changes. We can do that similarly with the square. We can change the size, the size and the pattern will change. Uh, similarly with the array, if we change the sizes, you can see it's a square array of holes and the pattern has uh, signatures of square and circular objects. And then with the sticker, uh, you can see if I change her size, you will dramatically change the pattern. And so it turns out the computer algorithm can take this scatter pattern and by putting in some redundancy or taking um, scatter patterns from adjacent areas with overlapping areas, the computer algorithm is smart enough to go from this intensity pattern to the original object. It might sound like magic, but it is now um, well, um, uh, well founded uh, in mathematics also. And so now let me go back to my slide deck if I can. So while you're doing that, Margaret, may I just ask? So, so is, is changing the, the pattern, you're saying it's reflected in scattering pattern, but that is that change is not used to to go backwards. You just no. scatter so pattern, do go is, back, yes. and then. But you're saying That's you a, can look at dynamics with this. Yes. So what you do to, first of all, let's let's talk about just the um, uh, the static image. So um, what we would do is shine the X-ray light. Say if I were doing this array of of dots, you would shine the um, beam 
not just on the array of dots, but you would move it around um, so that you were getting a view from slightly different sets of dots. So you would have redundancy in the scatter pattern is what that is um, saying that you have scatter patterns from partially overlapping areas. And that is enough for the algorithm to be able to recover a unique object. Okay. So it's, uh, it might sound like magic, but it, the, the same approach is actually used in electron microscopes because uh, if you look at their images, they're, they look very blurred, but by taking advantage of let's say 200 images, uh, one can really push down the resolution and it, it completely um, gets um, past you know, the, the current limitation on, on X-ray microscopes. And this is another way of showing it. So this is a picture of a, a glass with a newly mixed sugar water. If you shine a light bulb through it, you get a blur. But if you shine a laser through it, then you get a very distinct scatter pattern. And it's this scatter pattern that has information about the thickness of the glass and the curvature on the glass. Or another way to think about this is that uh, if you look at the colors in a soap bubble, the colors are giving you information on how thick the soap bubble is in different places. And so this phase um, is sensitive to the shape and thickness and what materials are present in a sample. And it's extremely powerful. It's much more powerful, actually, it might be hard to believe, but it is much more powerful than the actual scatter pattern. So let's take a look at an object here. So it's a, a rabbit and let's shine some light on it and see and look at the light that's scattered in the far field. And to those technical experts, that's called the Fourier transform. And so we'll get a scatter pattern. Uh, now our, our cameras don't measure this phase property, like the thickness of the, uh, of the um, uh, soap bubble. Uh, so usually if, if we don't have a good lens, then we're in trouble because if we just take, since we don't know the phase, if we just take the amplitude and the, the phase we have to assume is constant because we don't have any other information. And then we uh, try to recover the image, we'll, we'll recover. We'll, we, we don't know enough to be able to recover that image. So um, I hope nobody thinks this looks like a rabbit. Um, but now if we do the reverse, if we shine light again on the rabbit, um, but this time use the computer algorithm to guess the phase. And in fact, we don't even need the scatter pattern. Um, if we take a Fourier transform, uh, then within a, a, a uh, 180 degree ambiguity, because I didn't do a very fancy experiment here, you'll get a rabbit and its upside down companion. So phase is critical. It, it has so much information about the sample. And that's essentially what's letting us move beyond um, the traditional X-ray microscopes where you have amazingly short wavelength light, but you still get a blurred image to now where we can take coherent beams from synchrotrons or the X-ray free electron lasers or these tabletop sources and actually uh, achieve really um, things we couldn't do before. Um, the first sub-wavelength imaging, uh, the images of a 3D spin texture. Um, and let me show you a static movie of that. Um, and I just want to make sure that I, uh, finish up in the next few minutes, which is all coming along beautifully. So this is some beautiful work done as a collaboration between our group, Penn State, UCLA, and Lawrence Berkeley Lab, showing you the 3D spin texture in a nanomaterial where we can look at the magnetic field and visualize it and look at magnetic vortices and swirls and such and visualize what we call hedgehog and anti-hedgehog pairs. So regions where the spins are pointing outwards and pointing inwards. And we can also make microscopes that can peer into buried interfaces that can look at the thinnest of films, which are important for ne next generation nanoelectronics, and also discover um, how could we design more energy efficient nano devices by 
visualizing how heat flows at very small scale lens, where it turns out it flows completely differently than in the bulk. And people did not understand this or understand how the geometry mattered. And for any of you who are working in the summer and get a, you know, a reading from your computer, a warning from your computer saying, I'm getting too hot, shut down some things. And this happened to us last summer. Uh, we were working at home and our air conditioning failed. And so these are things that, that matter for um, designing the next generation devices. And uh, this technology is being adopted by industry. It's interesting. It took 30 years to do that. Um, this is uh, uh, not uncommon that, that a new and fundamentally new technology can take decades to get adopted, particularly if it's, if it's a very new technology. The same thing happened, it turns out, with um, MRI that's used um, in, uh, in, in imaging. Um, it was discovered in 1937, um, but the first a commercial device uh, was in 1961, and the first commercial, and that was a, an NMR spectrometer, but the first commercial MRI, it took until 1980. Um, and, you know, we can plot our technology, uh, we'll have to see if we make it to medical imaging or not. But uh, the one thing about anybody who develops new tools is that they have to have a lot of patience. Um, this was the first commercial um, NMR spectrometer spectrometer. Um, and uh, if you look here on this little uh, sign posted on it, and if I uh, zoom in, um, the uh, developing new tools is not for the faint hearted. Um, it warns this machine is subject to breakdown during periods of critical needs. It has a circuit called a crisis detector that senses the operator's emotional state in terms of how desperate he or she is to use the, ma the machine. It then creates a malfunction proportional to the desperation of the operator. Um, that would be the graduate student designing the new microscope and threatening the machine with violence only aggravates the situation. So keep cool, say nice things to the machine, nothing else seems to work. And I think that's, uh, uh, of course, that equally applies to software. I know Andrea's students, students have probably have often um, been in the same situation with the, the codes they're developing. And so with that, I really want to thank you for this opportunity to um, talk to you, um, to thank an amazing set of collaborators, and in particular, John and Hong at UCLA, um, Henry, my collaborator for decades, uh, Laura at Berkeley, and our students, Michael, Yuka, Josh, Nico, Travis, Ting, and Emma, who helped with this presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Margaret. That was, that was really interesting. Um, we do have a number of questions um, already. Uh, if anybody else has questions, please feel free to put them either in the Q&A or, uh, yeah, we'll put them in the Q&A. Um, so, the first question is from, from Daryl Williams. Uh, very interesting question. He said, it's unusual for research to be on the technological side of research and development, right? And also use the technology to study phenomena and, yes. and do the, do yep. the fundamental yep. science yep. of those phenomena. Yep. Um, can you share how you managed to do both of these things? Oh, oh collaborations, Daryl. And it's, it's sort of the, if it's the evolving maturity of the fundamental science. So just like you saw with MRI, we're not saying our technology is important as MRI at all, but just the point that when it happened with lasers also, when they were first developed, nobody had any idea what their uses would be. There's yeah, some very um, uh, funny uh, interviews of our shadow by Walter Cronkite where nobody had a directed beam of light so they couldn't imagine. Over time, as they figured out the laser science, then they started to get used for, um, let's say um, it wasn't even a beta application, it was a real prototype exploratory application. And then as some of the killer apps were identified, then people, if you put together a good team who, where some people knew the, um, the fundamental science and other people knew the application and they were interested in learning from each other, you could fill that gap, which is often the valley of death for a technology. So what I find fascinating is 
that uh, you know that you need different people for different timelines in a new technology because this is a quantum kit technology. Um, and then you do need people who like to work with other people because no one person has the full breadth in their brain. You, it's just impossible. So it's a really great era for um, an opportunity for team science. Thanks, Dara. Okay, so the next question is, uh, when seeking our own medical care, should we be asking about availability of cutting edge microscopy options instead of common x-ray or CT? Well, I think even, even the simple things of do they have, um, you know, the digital x-rays are, are much better. Um, this technology is going to take a while because right now, as I said, you know, um, uh, you know we, we're still, we, um, this, the technology in its current form is really great for nanoelectronics. Um, but to get to medical x-rays, we would have to push the technology to much higher energy photons. And the lasers needed to do that are just not available yet. And the understanding of what exactly is needed, we can't even address it computationally or theoretically because there isn't a computer big enough to do it. So that's going to have to be things that, you know, future people will explore, but there could always be a breakthrough in some of the laser technology that would make this possible. Um, you know, science advances and fits and starts, and usually breakthroughs happen when there's a convergence of different things like computation and cryo-electron or computation and lenses imaging. It's sort of, th though, is interesting that this region of the spectrum in between the hard x-rays that we've been exploring for a long time and the visible, where we've had very good microscopes for a long time, the region in between, um, is probably the best place to do uh, nanoscale imaging because the photon energy is low, so it damage, damages the sample the least. So you don't destroy the sample if you're trying to take a picture, um, but it has the potential for very good uh, nanometer type resolution um, and possibly even sub nanometer and has very, can have very high time resolution with these new light sources. So it's quite an interesting region to explore because of that. Okay, um, uh, let's see. The next question is, are there limitations to how small the technology can get before it fails to have utility? So right now we're designing them to fit these microscopes to fit, um, to be about the same size of the electron microscope, the image of the electron microscope. So which is the size of, um, so the most powerful electron microscopes fit in a room. These um, uh, microscopes would fit, let's say on a dining room table. So that's fine for the type of things that, that are used you know, in universities to, um, and or in uh, clinical labs or material science labs. Yeah, very much so. Um, okay, let's see. The next question is, oh, first a comment. Love seeing future scientists involved. You showed that nice picture at the beginning. Uh, at what stage of the educational pathway do specialties like this become apparent and attractive to students? Ah, th that's very interesting. So um, let me just give an, an example. So with uh, some of the undergrads we work with, um, what we say is because we're doing so many different things, you can come back to a different group and learn a different aspect of microscopy every summer, you know, because during the summer, the undergrads have time to do research. And so one recent student, she worked in our lab one summer and then in Jose's lab a different summer and in uh, another lab a different summer. And so then she was able to get a job with you know, Novartis because she had so many different understanding of um, microscopy. And so, um, so it's, you know, so, you know, it's a good question that, so, and maybe another way of saying it is that um, as an undergrad, of course, one has a major and one, is deep in physics or chemistry or bioengineering or computer science. But then as a graduate student, um, one has a, a more an ability to look broader, but the best way to look broad is with world experts because they will tell you if you have an idea and often people from outside the field will have a really good idea, but you need some sort of sounding board 
And then our students can talk to Laura's students or John's students. And in fact, you know, this, that's one of the reasons that um, UCLA can push the electron imaging so well. John was doing X-ray imaging and he realized that some of the algorithms he had developed for X-ray imaging were also applicable to electron imaging. So cross-fertilization is great. And if you can work with, they don't have to be the world's expert, but, they, but if you can work with people who are familiar with those or familiar with the applications as, as Daryl asked earlier, and if you can uh, work to solve a problem that can't be solved other ways, you know, then that's a really cool thing to do. And you learn a lot along the way. Yes, so I apologize. I hope you guys can't all hear the violin in the background. My daughter has a, a lesson. Um, <laughs> so this is what comes of zooming from home. Okay, so let's see. The, the next question um, is, so what is the science fiction application of these ultra-fast lasers? In other words, what blows your mind when you think about future possibilities for this technology? Well, I mean, one would be, imagine taking an X-ray instead of with the X-ray light bulb, but if you had a pencil thin, thin beam of X-rays, so you could just focus in on, on the area you wanted to look at, so you could see the edges of a cancer or a very small cancer. And, you know, th that is, you know, it's science fiction, but it's, um, there is no physics we know now that says it would not be possible. But that there's a lot of physics to do to make it possible. Okay, great. Um, so uh, normally we tell students you need a crystal to get sufficiently intense diffraction spots. Via exactly. Coherence. Exactly. So to do phase retrieval from a single object is the point that you now have huge intensity available? And it doesn't need to be huge. Um, so this is a great question. So uh, the scattered light from an ordered array of atoms looks very much like this, the light that we saw from the FET applet, that ordered array of, of circles. Very intense and very, very characteristic. But most of the objects that we're imaging are heterogeneous and that, that is the huge advance that the phase retrieval or lensless imaging lets you take an image of a non-periodic object. And uh, it does seem like magic. Um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah. Um, this is please discuss the role of coherence time in, of your strobe laser in the accuracy of your phase only imaging. Ah, so what matters um, for the, uh, the imaging is, is that, okay, so to do exactly what um, I just talked about, uh, to be able to image an arbitrary object, the phase structure spatially of the light you're using to illuminate the microscope, uh, that uh, cannot change in time. So you have to have a very stable beam in shape and in phase. So all the crests have to be lined up. And it turns out that if, um, so coherence time is a little different for uh, a long laser pulse versus a short, short laser pulse. Um, for our x-rays that we make, if, the, if they're, uh, Crests were not aligned perfectly to sub angstrom, sub attosecond precision, we wouldn't even see a beam because that is their wavelength or cycle time. Uh, so it turns out that you wouldn't even see a beam if your uh, effective uh, precision wasn't uh, in, at those length and time scales. Um, because it is not really a laser, it is a harmonic of a laser. Um, and you need to add the emission from many different atoms to that ex exquisite precision. So it is quite amazing. Um, okay, so um, what are the trade-offs in terms of the um, intensity of the beam? And, uh, you know, because if it's too intense, you damage the same. Yes. Absolutely. Right. Yep. So it turns out, yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. So you need to have enough light so you can 
Um, okay, the sample matters, of course, there's always trade-offs and um, two things you have to do is get enough light onto the sample that you get light scattered um, to the high angles because that is the information that you need to recover the tiny dimensions of the object. So you have, um, and in fact, that's one of the limitations currently when visible lasers are used if you try to see a very tiny object with a visible laser, you would have to use so much power that you would damage the object. And that, of course, if, if your wavelength is more matched to the dimension of the object, you have to use less power. And then if you combine that with the sensitive detector, one can collect a nice amount of scattered light with very high angles that gives you the information you need to construct the object with very high spatial resolution, but it is a good point that I should mention one big trade-off that when we don't use a lens, I've made it appear and sort of said multiple times, it's like magic, but it is, isn't. Um, sometimes it takes us a long time to actually read out the data and then process the data. And that's some of the ongoing research. It's the same with electron microscopy right now. Um, we can do it, but it's hero efforts. And so making that um, more data streaming and uh, you know analysis so we can read out the images and make possible this real-time microscopes. Those are some of the big challenges. If you have an object that's actually moving or has dynamics on the mm -hmm. path of time scale, um, you have to collect the different images every time uh, yep. from different, you know, within that time scale. Yep. Right. Yep. Yes. Yep. So what we're trying to do there is, and this is work in progress, but trying to see, can, can we um, see what pixels change so we don't have to redo the image every time, but just see what's changing or, or merge the ideas of holography and uh, lensless imaging, because in a hologram, you have a reference beam. So if you know one part of the sample isn't changing, you can use it as a a sort of a, a reference. And then the other thing we're trying to do is, which we can do is we're able to dynamically change the shape of the illumination beam that so we could match the illumination to the dynamics we're trying to um, extract uh, to make it easier to see or to enhance the static contrast or dynamic contrast. So there's a lot of tricks to play um, so um, a lot of exploration to be done till we know exactly how to make the best lensless microscopes. Yes, maybe we could just conclude by just saying, you know, there was the question about the science fiction application for, and for, um, and you answer for microscopy, but what about, you know, just the, just your lasers for, for other, for, any kind of application, if you oh you oh yeah, I mean, um, it, so I, yeah, so so if we could, for example, um, be able to look at a material and and watch the charges and the spins um, and the phonons move, it would be an amazing um, capability. And and actually, you know, that's sort of things we are thinking about how to do. Um, so that we can really look at a functioning material, uh, send a current through it, or, or look at an integrated device and see has the material changed when we've tried to make a better device. If we you know, think about a, a Josephson junction and we're trying to see, did we make the interface right? You know, are we keeping the coherence across the interface? So all of those things are things that we're um, looking at um, now. With, with our collaborators. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, that was really fascinating. And um, I encourage people to, uh, to watch the ceremony on uh, was Thursday. Yes, so Thanks congratulations so again, Margaret. Thank you for everything, Andrea and Daryl. We really appreciate it. And thanks for a beautiful lecture. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.